my oldest daughter, Carolyn, started going to Kensington Community School, and that's when I got involved with the uh, Toronto Chinese Parents Association. One of the great things about public schools is that all the immigrant kids and kids who have been here for generations all went to school together and grew up together. That's how you build trust. And for us, first-generation immigrants, it was through activism. I never grew up in a democratic system, so coming to Canada to actually participate in one was exhilarating. I was born in Hong Kong in 1947, and I came to Toronto as an immigrant in 1970. I grew up really poor in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, we lived in um, basically an old building crammed with families. There's only one water supply from the common communal kitchen for everybody. So we all had to use a public toilet across the street. I only actually have two pictures from my childhood. This one was uh, when I was four. And then the family grew. Uh, we became five of us kids with the two of them. All seven of us crammed into this tiny space. This is my parents, late 60s, in near the Hong Kong City Hall, I think. So my mother was the one who uh, had four years of um, elementary school, and she loved every minute of it. I always say it's a blind faith in education. And it was very, very difficult for all five of us to at least finish high school, which was really a big deal, and especially for the girls. Because in those days, girls from our background, usually we start working. So it's a real luxury for, you know, for us to be able to go to school, even though it was really tremendous hardship on the family and on ourselves too. But I was interested in the, in the arts and in writing. I used to write little short stories and stuff. And I used to love to watch films. Films really was opening my, my kind of, you know, eyes to all kinds of interesting things happening. I was actually watching films and reading about uh, students who would go abroad to study and all that. So all that kind of gelled into my mind. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't clear about what my ambition would be, but it's a general feeling that I wanted to leave and see something better. And I found out about the possibility of immigrating to Canada. I didn't know anything about Canada at the time, but the idea of being able to go to the West because I had no money, and this is the only way, uh, if successful, I could go abroad. And I think that's what counted for me. It took me a whole year and a whole process. I just had enough English to deal with the written application and the interview, so I applied. And I was successful. Tam and I came to Toronto together in 1970. We had met in 1969 in Hong Kong, and I was from New York. It was kind of an interesting uh, time that we came because I uh, came as one of the earlier immigrants to Toronto under the new, newly uh, uh, legal point system. And then Ted came as a result of the program to um, allow young American men to come to, the, to come to Canada because they didn't wish to participate in the Vietnam War. So it's a very historic time in our different circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
We've always lived in Kensington. We lived here when we were actually graduate students. We found the area. Just, it was so close to the University of Toronto, for one thing. But the fact that it was, a, at that time, it was a real immigrant area. Our neighbors were Portuguese, uh, Ukrainian, Jewish folks, and some old-time Chinese neighbors. So when Ten and I first got here, and we would walk down the street as a mixed-race couple, when we were in Chinatown, a few times there were uh, some Chinese folks who looked at us with a very hostile look. We could feel it, right? When somebody looked at you like that, you could feel it. Later on, when I met some Canadians, they were baffled as to where Hong Kong was, what is his relationship with China. Uh, and I was told once, uh, well, you're from Hong Kong, you're not Chinese. As an immigrant, when you come to uh, Canada, whatever academic credential you would have would have to be reassessed by the Ministry of Education to see where you fit along the Canadian academic status. So even though I graduated from high school, I was only assessed as having only grade 11. And I wanted to go to university. I was already, you know, in my uh, mid-20s. So I found out the only way I could go to university is through taking this course provided by uh, University of Toronto uh, for mature students. The first year was general. I took some anthropology courses and stuff like that. But the second year, I really knew what I wanted to do was to go further into Chinese and Japanese studies. Coming to Toronto uh, as an immigrant, you can feel easily that uh, you were excluded in all sorts of situations. Later on, when, when I worked as a school trustee too, I could see how immigrant children, racialized children, were treated differently at schools. Again, not accorded the same kind of uh, importance in the mind of the school system as other kids. So as a result, I was really motivated to really both in terms through education, as well as looking at the root causes of that um, bias and discrimination to try to solve it. My oldest daughter, Carolyn, started going to Kensington Community School. And then in the 80s, I uh, became involved with the Toronto Chinese Parents Association and worked on the whole very controversial issue of heritage languages. Hi. Good to you. Huh? So the reason why, say, the Chinese parents wanted to have just actually about two hours a week of Cantonese lessons for their kids is because once they start school, they basically are in an immersion English-speaking environment. And as time goes on, they usually lose their ability to actually communicate with, with their parents or grandparents or the family. Uh, yeah. Beautiful day, baby. Yeah. Yeah. You came back on your first day here. Yeah, I know, I know. You know, we were trying to say, if you can create a kind of a bilingual situation, the kids actually would do very well without losing their connection with their family. <laughs> Around here, the major languages spoken at home was Cantonese and Portuguese. So the Portuguese and Chinese parents work together. But because this is during the school day and you know public schools are supported by tax money, uh, that's where the opposition came in because a lot of the assumption was any immigrant who come here to Canada who want to keep their language, they should do it on their own dime. So we are proposing the parents, uh, we're proposing a different way of doing that in order to do that was really the parents are saying, we are part of this system, we want some respect. It's a good way for, for immigrant parents to learn school democracy. 
and then it got expanded to other school boards, eventually became a provincial policy. I first met with Tam in 1988 at a community gala uh, called Celebrations, organized by the Gaysians Toronto, um, the first LGBT group of Asians in Canada. Tam was going to be a school board trustee that year, and seeing an ally who is not only believes in equality rights, but come participate and celebrate with the communities it was very touching for me to see that. To me, Tam is both a comrade and a mentor. One of the most serious challenges faced by the Chinese Canadians in its history in Canada was the uh, Chinese Hack Tax and Exclusion Act. A total of $33 million was collected with uh, 61,000 people. In 1923, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act further amended to ban all Chinese immigration into the country. A lot of families are totally separated with their loved ones for decades. In 1979, CTVW5 aired an episode called uh, Campus Giveaway. Uh, in that program, it mentioned the higher education and professional schools gave away all the places to foreign students, and it's very hard for the Canadians to get accepted. It features all Canadians are white, and all the foreigners are Chinese. Many of the so-called foreigners in the program are in fact Canadian citizens or permanent residents in the country. The many Chinese Canadians during the time were so mad that they, 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 they organize and, and seek an apology. So the so-called NTW5 movement that actually helped galvanize the community and also build a national platform of uh, community activism and, and advocacy that actually help the hack tax redress for the years to come. Yeah, that's, that's a nice shot down there. And yeah. Because of that activism in the um, late 80s, I became a trustee to represent the Danforth area from 1989 to 1997. In the public school system, um, I think there's a lot of ideals that teachers are supposed to um, try to achieve, like equality or all that stuff. But what we were trying to do all this time, you know, working in the community um, and, and the school board, is that these are more than words. There are many, many things you have to do to find out how you can make all the good policies you have at the board actually a reality, that is not just empty words, because there's still racism.
I just don't understand how people can say that racism doesn't exist today. From a personal level, you know, as a school teacher, you know, I, I, you know, my the children talked to me a lot when I was coaching basketball, and they would go home after school, and and the police would be like following them, you know, and they would come back the next day saying, you know, Mr. Brief, I have no idea like why they would be following us. We weren't doing anything. They were just going home late after, you know, after after school, after the practice. So, you know, that that statement just doesn't. To me, it does, you know, they must be under a rug or they're just, just not paying attention or just being, you know, willfully ignorant about the fact that racism continues here in, you know, in Canada and, and, and in Toronto. It's almost like as if, you know, this, this myth of like multiculturalism is just always there, right? We're multicultural now, so racism can't exist, right? These days, the perceptions of um, Chinese Canadian immigrants, Chinese Canadian communities has, has really been influenced by um, this model minority logic, the way in which the racism is, is embedded within our institutions, that's really how it's uh, affecting us daily. Like, I mean, you think about how you have all these cultures mixing together and, you know, it actually makes the country stronger, right? Like, you actually have uh, a workforce that is smarter, brighter, if you focus on helping people kind of come together, work together. Chinese Canadians have uh, different experiences and different opinions. It's far from a homogenous group. There's no one power broker or a leader who can speak on behalf of all the diverse voices of Chinese Canadians. I defined what Chinese was based on what you did. Mm. and based on what our family did. I think I just took for granted, I just assumed that that's what women and Chinese women, and that that's what you do and that's what people like you do. It was sort of, I guess, if I was gonna generalize anything. One thing that makes you unusual is that you are, are so incredibly progressive with this intersectionality and understanding of structural racism and police brutality and all of this, and you came here as an immigrant, as an adult. And I think there is a, there's a perception um, that folks in the Chinese community who come as immigrants are more conservative and folks who are raised here or born here are, are more progressive. You've always been this social justice fighter that's just always been in you um, even as even though you don't you defy those those divisions and those stereotypes and you came as an adult. Now that uh, my two daughters are older and uh, and they have their own kids we're more conscious. I me as a you know, myself as a, as a grandmother, I <laughs> uh, had to pay a little bit more attention as to how to um, kind of uh, let them know the Chinese heritage. Growing up in Chinatown around all Chinese people and wanting to be identified as part of the community I'm from, I go out of my way sometimes mm. to participate in traditional things. I hold dear to me the things that identify me as Chinese. People say, where, where, what mm. are you? What's your culture background? If, you, if I explain I'm from Kensington Market in Toronto and those people have any idea of what that is, that kind of answers the question, you know? Because this is such a mixed place, because it's progressive, because it's full of immigrants and artists and, and poor people and rich people and the whole combination of sort of humanity that Toronto can produce, right? Um, that I feel good about Yuli being raised here. I just want him to feel good in his own skin. Yeah. And definitely. feel connected to his family's cultures yeah. in whatever way he wants to explore. Being an immigrant myself and also having worked with so many immigrant parents, including Chinese parents, a lot of times the uh, parents have very high expectations of their kids. They want them to become successful and in their eyes, being successful in Canada, you have to be a doctor, a lawyer, dentist, whatever professions that are kind of respected in society. So as a result, I think it really um, has, sometimes has a very limiting kind of opportunities for the, for the kids because kids comes, come with all gifts. 
So I hope that uh, these days, with more awareness in that um, area, that kids will have more opportunity to explore, like film or uh, writing, for instance. Canada actually has had a very fantastic tradition of writing Canadian history. But I don't think that's the case for immigrant communities. So it's very important for us in the Chinese community to document some of our past struggles, like to gain um, the repeal of the Exclusion Act, the redress for the Chinese head tax. We need to make sure that our voices are heard and help the community understand the diversity. Because if we don't know that, we have our own stereotype of our own people. I, I know it's difficult because when you start talking about that, they find it boring. So that's why it's important for uh, the younger generation to express and show our story in more uh, creative ways so that people don't look at it and then just turn away. So that's our challenge. If I am a fountain, I am a spring. You bathe in my rivers, giving you everything, everything, everything. I am a cup. Be the wine I'll drink till I'm thirsty, drink till I'm blind by your 